I think that means hello in Fiji. <laughs> but I got a bit confused and went around saying Gila, which is scriptural. I wonder they didn't understand it. We did try to go to church. There was going to be, and that was wonderful traditional hymn singing carol this morning. And that was what was going to happen at the Methodist Chapel or church on an island in Fiji. Traditional Fijian singing, they're wonderful. We did have to walk on water to get there, but the Lord graciously saved us by placing sand a couple of inches underneath it. Mm -hmm. So we arrived, only the fire were at the wrong church, it was all shut up. <laughs> they decided to have a combined service. So I wanted traditional, wonderful hymn singing, and here was I, outside a shut church, and I thought, here's my chance to become the laughing stock of Fiji. But instead of that, I was able to share. There was nine of us there, and there was a Fijian lady and her children, and maybe she was trying to wave church, I don't know. It didn't work, because I decided to do a short gospel address on John 3.16. And I did promise Ron I'd never be short again, and he didn't comment on it, but he probably thought a few things then. And the nurse on the ship was a Christian lady too, and she wonderfully shared her testimony of belief in Jesus Christ. So we didn't hear the singing, but we did have a good time. We conclude this morning on Acts 2.42, which says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And this morning we speak about prayers. It's a subject that many long books have been written about, and we'll only touch on a few aspects of it this morning. Prayer is to be both an individual exercise and also a body of Christ or church exercise. The prayer meeting is known as the engine room or power source of the church, and yet sometimes it can be sadly neglected. Thankfully, when we have our monthly prayer meetings here, they are well attended. We're told in Scripture to pray without ceasing. Well, you can't pray non-stop 24 hours a day, can you? But it is to be a natural way of life, just as breathing is. You try and stop breathing, your body will automatically start breathing again after you run out of breath. So also we should have that natural attitude of prayer on a daily basis. We look at the Lord's Prayer, and I'll only look at it briefly because we can speak about that easily for a long time. John Wesley's study considers that prayer must be broken down into three sections. It contains a preface, our Father, petitions, give us this day, etc., and a conclusion, a doxology. And in the notes from Charles Spurgeon's sermon on the Lord's Prayer, he considers that this context, this text is a model for prayer rather than something to be recited word for word. For example, when considering our sins, time needs to be taken to cite our wrongdoings and name them, confess them and ask for forgiveness. And certainly we do. I was at the Redcliffe Hospital with a lady whose husband was dying once. And because I've never been in a church that recited the Lord's Prayer on any regular basis, she asked me to recite the Lord's Prayer with her and I mucked it up and that was terribly embarrassing. But because she had faith, I was able to explain to her she can talk to the Lord in her own language and just share the thoughts and concerns and the grief in her heart. And so as we look at the Lord's Prayer just a little bit, we find it should be verse 8 rather than verse 9. It says, Therefore do not be like them, that is the Pharisees and the religious people who like to make a big fuss and pray in public on the street corners where everyone would see them and hear them and think how wonderful they are. Do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. And yet He still wants us to ask Him. He wants that communion, that fellowship with us 
as a loving father with his children. In this manner, therefore, pray. And the wording of that would suggest pray something along these lines rather than just recite it. It's not wrong to recite it. It's a wonderful prayer. But it gives guidelines for prayer. Our Father in heaven. It is a collective thing. It is our. We are belong together, the body of Christ, each one individually. And yet we address the Father as our Father. It intimates that we have faith and trust in Jesus Christ and we have a relationship of the Almighty Creator of the universe whom we can approach and address as Father, Abba Father, Father dear Father, sometimes translated as Daddy. And yet I find it very hard to say that because it just doesn't sound reverent enough. Maybe I'm being like those religious Pharisees in their prayers in public, I don't know. But that's the joy and wonderful relationship we have. We can approach the throne of grace and boldness through the blood of Jesus by a new and living way. And we can call him Abba Father, our Father, dear Father. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed means holy. It is not just a, any common name. It is a holy name of a holy God, even though we can address him as our Father. Your kingdom come. The kingdom of God is alive and well in the hearts of all believers, all those who put their trust and faith in him. <coughs> your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all around the world we do see the will of God being done through our believers in Jesus Christ, through the work of the body of Christ, the church on earth. I don't think it's been done as it is in heaven quite yet because the will of God reigns absolutely supreme in heaven. And it's not too hard to find faults and things where we don't quite measure up to that. But the day will come when Jesus Christ will reign in righteousness and rule of a rod of iron and the will of God will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the kingdom aspect in, within this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. I got to talk to a Fijian chap who said there was some, went to church and he found some things were strange. The priest or whatever was talking about only take one banana and leave the rest on the bunch. And I don't know how I was supposed to really explain that to him because I didn't know the context of it. But I suggested maybe it was from this, give us this day our daily bread. God wants us to ask for our daily bread. He didn't say, make me a millionaire. Because then we wouldn't be so dependent upon him. And that's the whole thing every day, he's speaking to our Father. Give us this day our daily needs. Just what we need to get us through. Let's not be greedy. Let's not pick the whole bunch of bananas. Let's just take one that God provides because the others would be green anyway and you'd get an ingestion. And forgive us our debts or in Luke's account our sins as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation. It's an interesting one that, isn't it? Because we know from James 1.13 that it says that God tempts no one. The Septuagint or the Greek scriptures didn't have punctuation marks in it. And if you put a punctuation mark after and do not lead us into temptation, it wouldn't quite work. But lead us not into temptation as some translations give. Lead us, comma, not into temptation. It would work, wouldn't it? I don't know whether you can do that or not, and much has been stated about this subject. But we know that God tempts no one, although Jesus himself was tempted by Satan. And God does allow us to come into the presence of many tests and temptations. But we do read in 2 Corinthians 2.14 that Christ always leads us in triumph. And so when we are in those testing times and the temptations that do occur, Christ is still leading us in triumph. <coughs> we might not feel triumphant at the time, but how closely are we following Christ? He is leading. Are we behind him? Are we beside him? Have we gone on a sidetrack? 
and we moved on ahead. He leads us in triumph, and so let us closely follow him, for he will lead us through. But deliver us from the evil one. We are told that we can be involved in that too. He will deliver us. But we are told to resist the devil and he will flee. Draw near to God and he will draw near to us. Sounds easy, doesn't it? The preceding line is be in subjection to God. And then we can resist the devil and tell him to flee. And he will have no choice. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There is the doxology side of things. <clears throat> and it is always good to end in praise, in worship, and in thanksgiving. And it continues, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It is good to have forgiveness in your heart to anyone who has done wrong to you. My mother didn't bother to tell me my father died and that he'd been buried. It took me years before I wrote to her and told her that I forgave her. And I had peace in my heart forever after from that point on. She wrote back and said she'd done nothing wrong because this was in a religious cult. But I was able to go and see her and pray for her and with her before she died. Forgive those who have wronged you. Do not hold grudges. We go on to the Lord praying, which I call actually call the Lord's Prayer. It's an absolutely wonderful passage of verses. John 17, 1 to 26, and please take time to read them. And there's a theme going through it. He's praying for those that the Father has given him, and all those who have come after believing in his name. And he says, Father, that they may be one, even as we are one. And wherever you go around the world, you meet a fellow believer, whether it's that Fijian Christian we were sharing with. You have that enormous sense of oneness, of bond in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Despite the fact that we've managed to divide the one church up into so many different groups. We are all one in Christ. Then we go to John 14, and I'm trying to keep him, if we can get that one up, please. I tend to forget it's up there. I'm not used to these things. Jesus introduces a new principle. Instead of our Father, he says, John 14, 13, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I, in brackets, Jesus will do it. So we can address the Lord Jesus in our prayers and ask him, and he has promised that he will answer them. What about the Holy Spirit? I don't know of any prayers to the Holy Spirit in the Bible, although the Holy Spirit is God himself, so I would never dare say it is wrong to pray to him. But the role that the Holy Spirit takes is seen in Romans 8. We go to the next one, please. Romans 8, 26, 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us of groanings which cannot be uttered. What divine intensity there is there. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we'll talk about that shortly. How wonderful to have the Holy Spirit of God interceding for us. When I hear of Christians being massacred and murdered in the persecuted church, <coughs> my first temptation is to call down for fire and judgment from heaven, and it shouldn't be. They're praying for their conversion. So when we do not know how to word our prayers, the Holy Spirit takes the real thoughts and the intents of the heart and presents it to the Father just as it should be. And that's a wonderful thing. Because there are times when it's very difficult to know how to pray about some of the circumstances in life that we find ourselves in. 
Then we come to a section I've called hindrances to prayer. And everything we do in our daily lives as believers can be, if we're not careful, a hindrance. <coughs> James 5.16 says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The NIV says it's powerful and effective. And there is that call for righteousness in our life. If we want to have a prayer life and see our prayers answered effectively, one, we need to be fervent in prayer, not just uh, God bless the missionaries or God heal the sick, but be specific in our requests, fervently praying that God will answer our prayer. And if we are in a righteous state before the Lord, that will benefit greatly in having our prayers answered. 1 Timothy 6.1 addresses a bondservant. Paul called himself a slave and a bondservant of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but here it's speaking about those who were slaves. Some had masters who were Christians. They also were Christians. <clears throat> Paul is telling them to obey their masters as under the law. He says, let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honour so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. The word blasphemed in the Greek means to be maligned or spoken of in a detrimental way. And so by our willingly still obeying their masters, they are setting an example to all those around them how we as Christians should love those and be obedient to those who are over us. Despite the fact that they are both saved the same way, they were both a new creation, they were both in Christ Jesus. They were still to obey their masters. Then in Titus 2, 1, why do they, 1 to 15, it's a great passage, I'm only looking at verses 1 to 5. Why did I pick this scripture? Could get me unpopular. But it refers to, dare I say it, our age group. We go to 1 John 2 and it speaks, I write to you little children, or I write to you young men. But some of us are getting to the stage of being just a wee bit long of tooth. I'll only look at myself and but I'm getting a bit old. So this is for some of us who are getting on. It says, as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, that's me, the older men, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience, the older women likewise, that they may be reverent in behaviour, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, but they may, that they may admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their husbands. And again, the purpose that the word of God may not be blasphemed. We might think some of these things are only little, only not important. But look at the emphasis that God's holy word puts on it. Are we going to, by the way in which we live our lives as believers in Jesus Christ, give an avenue for those who are watching us as unbelievers to point the finger and say, you are not living according to the way a Christian should. And we don't want to be that sort of a testimony. We want to be ambassadors for Christ. We want to sh share the light and love of Christ out into this world around us. And because that verse brings in the thought of wives being obedient to their husbands, it also says, husbands, love your own wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And I would have to stand here today and confess that I haven't measured up to that standard in love for Norma, even at our 40th wedding anniversary. How many of us could say that we have loved our wives in the same standard as Christ loved the church and gave himself for them. And so for whatever our circumstances may be, let us live up to these ideals that God's word has put before us. If we want to have an effective, effective prayer life, powerful and effective, of much of our, a lot depends on the way in which we live out our practical Christian way of life.
many theories have been given as to why we don't our prayers aren't answered. Some say that we haven't got enough faith. And sometimes that may be true. Some say there is some secret sin. So only sometimes that also may be true. Some sin not repented of. Wrong wording of prayers. I was brought up to pray for these and the theirs. But God's not interested in that. That was just the language of the day in King James. But some of these things are worth considering. It's not necessarily so, but as we examine ourselves, before we come and break bread, we can see whether there is any sin in us and confess it, because he is able to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are also told, though, to pray believing. Matthew 21, 22, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Sounds very easy, doesn't it? But there's more to it than that. John 15, 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. I prayed believing as a young man when I wanted a wife and I'd selected one out and I prayed and I told God I believe this is right. And something went wrong and the relationship broke up and I had to go home and look in the mirror and there's no problem there. So out I went and started again. Same thing happened. I'm not going to tell you how many times that happened. It's too embarrassing. But I wasn't praying, believing. I was simply praying a prayer of demand to God and saying, I have chosen, now rubber stamp it. And that's not praying, believing. That's a prayer of demand. And so we come to the next section which must go with pray and believing. And that's pray according to God's will. 1 John 5, 14 to 15. Now this is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. <coughs> and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. As in John 15, 7, the key is, my words abide in you. Be a Berean and search the scripture daily to see if these things are got past so. How can we pray according to his will? His will is revealed to us in this book that he has given. And if we immerse ourselves in it daily, we will be able to pray according to the will of God. But even there, I can remember prayers where every line was, if it's your will. And it really sounded almost like a prayer of doubt, as if God couldn't do it. So we had to pray in the right balance of believing and yet according to God's will. Does God always hear and answer our prayers? This is the next section I put up there and running out of time rapidly. James 4, 3 says, You ask and do not receive because you ask of wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Wrong motive, prayer answered no. Sometimes God answers yes, and he's already answered the prayer before we realise it. Sometimes he says wait. <clears throat> Sometimes he says no. Either because it would be damaging for us or because he has something much better in mind for us. Psalm 66, 16 to 20 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Again, any unconfessed sin. But read that passage from 16 to 20. It's a wonderful, glorious passage to read. Jeremiah 11, 11, Therefore thus, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on them, that is upon Israel, which they will not be able to escape. And though they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Sounds sad, doesn't it? And that is a theme running through the Old Testament. But we must never lose sight. God is always merciful, loving and forgiving. Even though we are steeped in sin, when we come to him in repentance, there is mercy and forgiveness available. John 9, 31, Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshipper of God and does his will, he hears him. They were the religious leaders of when Jesus healed the man of the blind man. 
And they got it wrong too. They didn't understand the mercy and forgiveness of God. They wanted to try and find the blame. Was it this man's fault? Was it his parents' fault? And we don't have time to go into that. But the principle is, let us be right with God and let us do it now. Tomorrow may be too late. But does God always answer prayer? Does he even hear some prayers? When God called children of Israel out of Egypt, Pharaoh continually refused to obey. And it says God hardened his heart. In Romans 1, 24 to 32, speaking about a subject that is constantly in the news, homosexuality and devious, <coughs> deviant behaviour in all its forms. It says God gave them up to their vile passions. And if you read verse 32, you'll find it's a very serious thing. Unrepentant sinners, it seems, can come to that point where God just gives them over. Does it ever reach a stage where it is too late for them to repent? I don't know, but there is the suggestion there that it could be possible, whether it's in Pharaoh or whether that in that case in Romans 1. The good news is that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all may come to repentance. My favourite scripture on prayer is Philippians 4, 6-7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. A wonderful passage of Scripture and a promise that we can claim and that we can experience on a daily basis. The hymn writer spoke this way, Take time to be holy, speak off with the Lord, abide in Him always and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be, thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. May we, as believers at Living Hope Church of Christ, continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Father, help each one of us to live our lives in a way that pleases you. As we face tests and temptations and trials in this world, we thank you that you are a loving Heavenly Father, that we've come directly into your presence, and that we know that you will answer us. Father, help us and strengthen us to be that light in this world around us by the way we live, that others may come to save with faith in Jesus Christ and know the joy that we possess. We ask it in Jesus' worthy and precious name.